Hi, I'm Julia Neiman. I'm so happy to be here with you today to tell you my story about how I got to where I am and what I'm doing today. So what I do is I teach disaster preparedness with a focus on fire prevention. Uh, I happen to live on a mountaintop in the middle of the Los Padres National Forest in Southern California, and we get a lot of fires. So that's what we are, um, that's what we're focusing on. So how I got here, you know, I have always had divine intervention to lead me on my path, no matter what. When I was in college, I wanted to be a journalist and life just kept putting me on the path of children. And I finally got the picture and I let go of journalism and I started working with children. Um, and each step along the way brought me toward being a life skills educator. And I started out, I got a master's degree in social work. I was a clinical social worker with uh, teenagers in foster care. And none of them wanted to have their heads shrunk. And they said, you know, we've been through this. We don't want it. So rather than do that, I started teaching them life skills in order to increase their confidence in, in themselves and to be ready for when they were aging out. And I saw such a turnaround in these kids that that was it. From that moment on, I had to teach life skills no matter what I was doing or focusing on. It was life skills. And then that took me from life skills in general to teaching them how to become entrepreneurs. And some of my students, or I should say my clients, flourished. I mean, it was just amazing for them to see that they could actually start a small business doing something that they were so passionate about uh, and that they loved and make money from it. And they were thriving. And, and after emancipating out of foster care, they got apartments, they had successful lives, they bought cars, they did not have to be on the system and collect food stamps and welfare. So that kept me on that path. And then at one point, I was semi retired already and uh, was offered an opportunity in, in the high desert. I lived down in the high desert and was offered an opportunity to participate in a three year pilot program with the County of Los Angeles in my area to, um, to, to learn disaster preparedness, to become an expert in disaster preparedness and start teaching that. And also beyond being prepared to create a culture of resiliency. And that meant bringing the entire community together. And in, in our case, we had to merge two communities because of the population. We needed a certain number and both communities brought us up to that number. So, um, so that's what I did. And it was so rewarding. I had such a great time with that. And over the three years we were funded each year, we got $15,000. Uh, and what we did with that $15,000 was like, it amazed everybody. We had no doctor's offices in our area at all. The only doctor's office was an acupuncturist. And what we did was we put out the word that we were looking for retired medical staff. We were looking for nurses, EMTs, paramedics, anybody that had any kind of medical training whatsoever. Well, before you know it, we had like 29 people signed up. We had retired um, medical doctors. We had nurses. We had EMTs and paramedics, people that were retired and currently working in the profession who signed up to develop an, an emergency procedure where if we had an earthquake and that area was prone to earthquakes. So if we had an earthquake and had to do um, emergency first aid or had some serious injuries, then what we did was we planned a whole, we made a whole plan like they were gonna do a load and go, put them in the car, take them to this office that at least had um, treatment beds and things like that. So we would take them there and treat them there. The doctors and nurses would come and report to that area and we would take care of it that way because we were told, and this is really important to know around the world, this is happening worldwide, that people need to start taking personal responsibility 
for being prepared and for what they're going to do and how they're going to take care of their family because they're with the increased fires and emergencies around the world. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit, but with that, the personnel available to help us is less and less. And I'm going to talk specifically about Southern California uh, because that's where I live. That's my experience. We have such a shortage. Um, COVID came through and decimated the sheriff's department and the fire department and the forest service included in that just took out so many employees and they're having a really hard time replacing them, especially in the sheriff's department. They're having a hard time. Uh, they're taking in unqualified people because they need bodies in the seats. And that's how bad it is. So we have been told that they're not coming. Don't expect any help we have to fend for ourselves. So in doing that, we are trying to teach disaster preparedness and teach people to be ready and what they need to do and how to create a plan, how to create a contact plan, how to, um, to have a plan where, you know, your whole family knows who to contact to let them know you're okay or let them know that they need help. Uh, and we're working on an evacuation plan now in the area where I live on this mountain. We have one road. It's a two lane road, one lane going one way, one lane going the other way. If we have a fire, we could be trapped here. We're not so much worried about the earthquake, although the San Andreas fault line runs right through our community. But we're not really that worried about that because we do have earthquake standards. Most of the homes uh, we'll be able to survive an earthquake. The danger from earthquake, though, happens to be fires. When we had the Northridge quake in Southern California in 1994, we had um, that caused 110 fires. And the major damage, other than that one, uh, that one apartment building that fell down and a few places where the freeway broke, we and and when you consider the number of people living in Los Angeles, that there were only 16 deaths, and some of those were from heart attacks, not even from the, the actual earthquake. So, um, so these are the things we need to be prepared for. It's fire is really the important thing, and um, so we we were looking at where you know we're going to these uh, live events, we go to fairs, we share materials, we have a lot of materials, we hand out things from FEMA, we hand out things from uh, the state of California, the fire department, we've got a lot of information to share. We've got great partners that we do these events with. So, um, so there's no lack of materials. But we were sitting around talking one day and wondering how many people actually look at these materials or use them. I, most people throw them away and just use the bag you handed them in. So we thought, how could we get around that? And the way, way we are approaching that is taking our education into the schools. So we are going to elementary schools in our county and it's in Kern County, California now. And we are going into elementary schools and we're going to expand this. We want to include the entire school district in the county. And we do have support from the county supervisors to do this, which was a long time coming, but we finally got it. So we're going into the schools and what we find is that the kids are so enthralled and we have things that are kid related. We also have things that they can bring home to the family. We come in and do a presentation, it's two days and we do a presentation. And then they have a homework assignment the first night, which involves their family. So they have to go home and discuss what happened with the family. And then whatever the homework is assignment is, they need to do that with their families and then bring it back to us. So, um, so that's our approach. And the kids love it. And the teachers are reporting that even months after the presentation, they're still talking about it. And they're talking about what they're doing at home to prepare. And they're taking this very seriously. And whereas the, the adults just don't, they don't take these things seriously. That's one of our biggest challenges. So, um, 
So that's what we're doing. And we've been highly successful with that. And we're getting funded again. We hand out um, go bags, what we call go bags, emergency bags filled with supplies that that's are intended to jumpstart the family's disaster preparedness kit. And it's got, we have an emergency radio in it. We have flashlights, we have carabiners, we have all kinds of things. Plus um, the, the, um, documentation that they need that family can fill out documentation of all their financial things which if you have to go to a shelter you have all of this on a form already filled out which is very helpful you don't have to stand in line um, so there's all kinds of things that we give them to jumpstart their preparedness plan and they're it's huge it's just catching on and schools are now calling us and saying can you come do a presentation at our school so we're just totally, totally excited about that. Um, and, and we hand out these bags. So we just got funded for more bags and more things to put in it. And we're going to continue this project. This was hugely successful. We, got, we have other shopping bags for adults. Um, and the, oh, the other thing we got, we're so excited about this one too. We just purchased an inflatable fire education house. And it's ADL compliant, so people in wheelchairs can come through. And we work with the fire department and the Forest Service and Southern California Edison uh, to come in and actually teach families as they're going through this house what's safety and what's not safe in terms of how you plug things in. Did you know that if you pull a plug out of the wall by the cord, you could start a fire. That's a really dangerous thing to do. I didn't know that. I, I used to do that. Just grab the plug and pull it out. It's a lot easier than trying to get the plug out of the wall. So little things like that. And we teach them that as they go through the house. Because in the United States, 94% of all fires are started by human behavior. That's a shocker, isn't it? I, and that includes forest fires and wildfires. And I always thought that the majority of forest fires were started by lightning strikes. That is not true. Very few fires are actually started by lightning strikes. And in California, the Forest Service, and they probably do this all over the country, the Forest Service actually is out there right after a storm where there's been lightning, checking for fire and getting it out immediately. So they've got that down. So yeah, 94% of human behavior and, and globally it's 84%, which is, is, that's just shocking to me. And so we absolutely need to teach this as a life skill. We need to start young when these people, are, when these our kids are in school and start teaching them from, from elementary school on how to have proper behavior. You know, if you're gonna smoke, don't throw your cigarette butts on the ground. Simple little things that people don't think about. Uh, fires, we have a fire burning now nearby that's close to freeway. It, it started out at 150 acres yesterday. It's now at 6,000 something acres. It's very fast moving. We have the Santa Ana winds are blowing. So learning fire behavior is another thing that we try to teach people, like knowing how a fire works, how it moves through the grass. That will give you an idea of whether you need to start preparing ahead of time for evacuation. So you could see why these are all really important life skills to have, something that you should just know. And knowing these things actually builds your confidence. When I was working with the, the children in foster care, um, I was working at a group home and I taught my kids earthquake safety just in case. I mean, there was no earthquakes, you don't get a warning, but I thought it would be a good thing to do. And so I taught them earthquake safety. And when you know, two weeks later, we had a major earthquake, but they were ready. Each one of them would have been assigned a job. They got up, they weren't scared, they didn't panic, they hopped into their shoes, they ran out and did their job. They checked the gas line, they checked whatever they were supposed to check. And they came in and they felt so good about themselves. They were so happy and they talked about it for months, how they didn't panic, they knew what to do. And that was really the first time that, that I saw physically the, the importance of teaching these skills and how they build confidence because before that they would have panicked. 
what, what do I do? Where do I go? And that, that really is where most of the injuries happen after a major disaster is people panicking. So whatever we can do to mitigate the panic is a really good thing. Now, I want to talk about some of the challenges because there are tremendous challenges in putting together programs like this, resistance being one. But the biggest challenge I have found is complacency. People are very complacent. They're like, yeah, yeah, I know an earthquake's coming. But, you know, we haven't had an earthquake since 1994. So what are the chances? And they don't feel like they need to do anything. And, and me personally, I've taken it a bit further because I do live in the mountains. We have power outages here. We have winter storms. The snow comes. You can't get out. And what do you do? The power goes out. I've got a little um, Bunsen uh, a stove, a, um, a propane stove that you can use in the house. And uh, I've got or butane. Sorry, I've got a butane stove you can use use in the house. I've got food. I started canning my own food and putting that up so I would have things that, that I know I could eat that wouldn't make me sick or upset my stomach. I mean, I, I'm ready. I, I've gone as far as I can go. I don't have any more room for any supplies. So I have to stop. But complacency is a huge challenge where people just like, oh, yeah, 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 it'll be okay. And it's not okay. I mean, where we live, we don't, we hardly have any food. We have a little grocery store. It's a convenience store. What do you do when the food runs out? And the food is already scarce on the shelves. So being prepared and knowing what to have on hand is really important. Most people don't think of putting vitamins or minerals that they need or having extra uh, prescription, an extra month or two of prescription pills that they might need. They just don't think of that. And most pharmacies won't give you that. But um, I've had a conversation with my doctor, knows what I'm doing. And he actually talked to the pharmacy and got me an extra month of something that I need to have on hand just in case. Um, and we've had many times where we've been snowed in. So it's really having situational awareness, looking at your environment and figuring out what do you need to do? And other challenges when we're working, we're, we're also the next thing on our list at, for the Kern Fire Safe Council is um, starting a community of resiliency. We work specifically with what they call the wild urban interface areas, which is people that live in the forest. So maybe you live surrounded by forest land or you live on private land in the forest. Um, and that's what most of our communities are, private communities, but in the forest. So we work with those areas and we have, um, we have transportation issues, we have uh, food availability issues. There's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration and we all get snowed in, you can't get in or out. So we have to plan for that. And the biggest challenge in putting together a community project of any kind really is jurisdiction because you're talking bureaucracies, all these county departments, the sheriffs, the CHP, the fire department, you know, they, they all have jurisdiction over certain things and they don't want to relinquish that. It's hard getting them to work together. So, um, so that's one of the biggest challenges. And the state has actually recognized that as a huge challenge. And one of the ways that we are getting beyond that challenge is each county is now um, being funded for a county coordinator. And it's the county coordinator's job. And we're very involved in this. The, when I say we, I mean the Fire Safe Council. We're very involved in getting um, all these agencies together to figure out a way past all of this bureaucracy. How can we work together? What can we do? And it's not only the bureaucracies we're working with, the county agencies, the state agencies, but private nonprofits as well, what we call mitigation partners, anybody that's working toward fire mitigation and, and identifying hazards and then mitigating the hazards to prevent fires. We're doing home ignition zone projects, which is going through these communities 
and assessing all the homes in the community to, um, you know, to see which ones need to be home hardened so that they will survive fires. And the whole idea is to create it so that embers don't get under your roof or into your vents. And it's just really simple things that you can do to home harden your house. So that's how we're dealing with that major challenge. And then globally, why this is important globally, um, which ties in with Global Life Skills Days, because this is related to climate change. And even though human behavior is responsible for most of the horrendous fires that start, um, they are driven by conditions created by climate change, whether it's severe drought or heavy winds. I mean, everywhere you go, there's something that's related to climate change that we have to deal with, like flooding, um, the huge storms that are coming through that cause power outages and people don't have water for a long time. Things like that need to be addressed or, or we're in for a really rough road ahead. So that's why it's important globally. Everything we can do to address it on a smaller scale will help somebody else somewhere in the world address these issues and make life a little better. Um, so that's why I do what I do. I, I'm totally dedicated to this, it, you know. Yes, I benefit from this. I want to stay safe. I want my friends and family to remain safe. But really, if what I do on this smaller scale can help some place in the world make things better for them, then that's why I do what I do. And I'm going to continue to do it until my last breath. So it was a pleasure to be able to share my story with you. I very much enjoyed being here. Um, I, I don't, don't know what I would do if I weren't teaching life skills because it's just so much a part of who I am now. Um, and it's, it's my pleasure to do it. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.